Her name was Mary. Mary and I shared much of the same story. We both had two kids that were three years apart. We both worked in a church and were remarkably close in age. But the truly weird thing is that though we were both living in Virginia Beach, both of us were actually from Ashland, Kentucky. That's enough of an anomaly to get us talking because nobody's from Ashland, Kentucky. Ashland is this tiny little town on the West Virginia, Kentucky border, and there is not much there. There's a reason that both of us moved, and that was enough to draw us into friendship. <laughs> but here's where the similarities ended. Mary knew Christ, and at that point, I did not. And yes, you heard me correctly, I was working in a church. Now you know my story, but Mary treated me as a sister in Christ. This is what I mean. She would call me and she'd tell me things that were going on in her life, the ugly thoughts that she had about them, the pain that they caused, how she wanted to respond in anger, and she'd ask me what to do. Now most of those things were things I did not want to know in the first place. And this is the reason. As long as she didn't share her vulnerabilities, then I didn't have to come face with mine, face to face with mine. Surface friendships are much easier. They don't dig down into the mess and expose it to someone else. I didn't know what to do with her pain, with her anger, or with her temptations, or any of that mess because I did not know what to do with my own. It was only after I came to know Christ that I realized what a gift she'd get given to me. That in sharing her own struggle, she invited me to share mine with her so that together we could take them to Jesus. You see what a gift that is. It was only after coming to know Jesus that I understood the freedom of not having to hide the good, the bad, and the ugly. The gift of being able to call a, a Christian friend and share struggles, knowing that they were not going to despise me because of those things, but rather they would pray with me, help me sort through the mess and learn to stand strong. She was the very first to model that love for me. Everybody needs a Mary in their life. Well, Mary and I both moved on about the same time, and God brought Barbara Edwards into my life not long after that, 28 years ago on the Emmaus Walk. <laughs> and we walked and prayed together off and on through lots of the stuff of life, much of which was ugly and painful. And I was so grateful for her listening ear and for the constancy of her love. If you've been at dinner church, you've experienced some of that love. She's the one that comes up and hugs. Everybody walks in the door. Well, then I went to work for St. Paul's in Chesapeake, and I met Janet Moore 25 years later. Um, I was in one of those seasons that you would just rather forget existed. And Janet was the one who listened to my frustrations and my anger, made sure I had what I needed, bawled me out when I needed to be bawled out, and prayed like crazy for me. See, she's always had a heart to restore the brokenhearted, and you're watching the fruit of that happen in Trauma Reboot. Then I went to Bay Lake, and I, there you are, and, and met Cindy Fight. Cindy and her husband, Steve, um, were part of my small group. And we walked through part of that grief together when Steve died, but now she's come alongside here in ministry, yes, in grief share. But I'll tell you what, if you need a prayer partner, that's a powerhouse sitting right there. She has such a gift, such a gift. Do you see a pattern in that? I can go back through it. <laughs> Do you see a pattern in that? Okay. Christ poured his love into each of us and then wove our lives together in that same love and set us into service together to make a difference in the kingdom of God. This chapter of Experiencing God talks about that kind of Christian friendship, Christian community. It's called koinonia, and that's a word that's translated as fellowship, and that's a wimpy translation because it really means so much more than that term as we use it anyway. There's an intimacy to it that our often shallow relationships cannot touch. The root of that word gives us a clue as to how it's held together and lived out. Um, the Greek koine, for example, means to share 
something with someone, well, what do we share? We share the love of Christ because it's been given to us, right? I knew you knew that. Maybe there was just a little prompting. So what do we share? Thank you, Lord, in your mercy. Hear my prayer. So koinonia is intimate, loving fellowship, sharing life, real life together based on the love of God that's first poured into us and then is poured out through us. It's a love that draws us together in relationship, in his presence. Did you notice that it's cross-shaped? And so it will require something of us, right? We can see it in the scripture in these ways. There are two passages um, that give us an overall picture. Genesis 2, 25 takes place in the Garden of Eden in the presence of God. And it says this, that the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Now the kind of nakedness that's described there has nothing to do with clothes. Please hear that. Rather, it means that there is nothing hidden. Nothing hidden. There's no need to hide from each other because everything's clear. It's out in the open. I know where you stand. You know where I stand. And we love each other through Christ, right? No need to hide from each other nor from the presence of God because we're right with him as well, right? So there's an intimate, unbroken relationship, a fellowship between all. At that point, sin had not entered the world, so that's a picture of the relationship that we are intended to have. It was lost in the fall, but Jesus came to restore it. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus came to restore that. He says in Matthew 18, where two or more are gathered, that there he is also. Now think about this. If there's nothing between us, nothing that needs to be hidden, and we're loving each other with his love, that's the koinonia fellowship. Nothing hidden, everything out in the open, in love with God and one another. Now that either ought to scare the pants off of you, or it ought to excite you. Quite honestly, I hope it excites you because if it scares you, then we need to have a conversation about where you are with the Lord. That koinonia, that intimate fellowship, love and concern in relationship isn't meant to just be between one or two or three or four as the case may be, but rather that kind of love is actually to characterize the entire church of Jesus Christ. And again, there's a, a picture in Scripture in Acts 2. There we read about a new community of believers coming together in Jerusalem right after Pentecost. And these are the things they did. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching because we are to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the unity of the faith together until we become mature, looking like Jesus, right? These are the other things they did. They ate together. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. They prayed together. Thank you, Lord. They experienced manifestations of God's presence in miracles. We've experienced some of those at dinner church. And when someone really needed something, they found a way to meet that need. Now, Scripture says they even sold their property and possessions as necessary so that nobody went without because that love of God was so great within them that it poured out of them. Does that make sense to you? That kind of love, that kind of connection, that will change a city, and it did. God added to their number daily those who were being saved. He could trust newcomers to that kind of fellowship. Could he do that here? <laughs> See, we've experienced some of that on a little bit of a smaller scale between friends, but also in some of our small groups. They become safe places where we can be vulnerable together and know that we're going to be loved through those things. Does that make sense to you? Now, here's the thing. Having done some of that work, it would be easy just to simply sit back and enjoy that fellowship together because it is a rare gift, isn't it? 
But that kind of love, remember, it's cross-shaped. It requires something of us. It is not just about us, rather about what this God who has poured his love into us might want to do through us. You might want to get your feet off the floor because I'm about to start preaching. We see that perspective all through the New Testament. The Christians in Jerusalem are in need, so an offering is taken to meet it. It's costly, but love demands it. A group of people in enemy territory hear the gospel and they start to respond. Some of the believers are sent to baptize, to lead. It's costly, but love demands it. A church of new believers is beginning to come together in Antioch. So a teacher is sent from Jerusalem. But the need for teachers is so great that the one who is sent goes and finds another one who will come. It is costly, but love demands it. Evangelists are needed to carry the gospel to places that it's never been. Two are set apart and sent from one church. It's costly, but love demands it. The question of sound doctrine arises and all of the churches come together to discern the will of God. It is costly, it's time consuming, it's hard work, but if they were to grow together in the unity of the faith, love demands it, does it not? See, this is a love that we're called to share. It's a costly love. What has been poured into us is meant to be poured out through us. That means that we can't stay right here and do the work that God has sent us to do, doesn't it? I warned you, it's coming. What might it look like here? Well, if we just consider what we have here, maybe it looks like trauma reboot moving into abused women's shelters because it's necessary. Lives are broken and they need to be restored. We have the ability to do that, don't we? Maybe it looks like grief share partnering with funeral homes. Lord, in your mercy, if ever there were a need for the presence of Christ to be, might it be? Might you be called to go? Oh, that got quiet now, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> ah, help. But we're not the only Christians in Hampton. What if? What if instead of starting a new dinner church on our own, we partner with another church to start one in another place in the city or in another one where it's so needed? What if it's not just about us going out but joining with other people? Oh my, could the love of God actually spread between churches? Woo, Lord, in your mercy. What if we come together as churches to pray, to ask God what he wants to do in the city of Hampton and then work together to see it done? Might Hampton see and experience the love of Christ as we've experienced it? Lord, in your mercy. What if we quit building our own kingdoms and started to build his? I warned you. You know, this morning we've been praying about the possibility of aligning with the new denomination, the Global Methodist Church. And we've been talking about this for several months. It's not a new conversation. What I love is the doctrine is sound. There are safeguards set in place to make sure it remains so. But what excites me are the possibilities that it opens up for the love of God to be spread. That very thing that we've been talking about just this morning. What if, what if we partnered with Greg West and that ministry, Life in His Name? See, Greg is an evangelist with a global Methodist church, and he's working in all these different cities right now to reach new believers. What if we partnered with him? What if you were called to go with them to reach new believers? Lord, in your mercy, one of the things that Global asks is that a church, we, as a church, we gather together in small groups to share life, real life, not the facade that sometimes passes for it, so that we can grow together in love, strengthening and encouraging one another in faith. See, that should sound familiar. I'm excited by that. How about you? One of the possibilities that aligning ourselves with Global opens up is that of partnering with other churches to start new church plants. They've already started partnering with Asbury Seminary. And so between Asbury and Global, they're going out to the nation. They're going out internationally to start new churches in new places. Do you think that we might just have something that they might need in order to do that? See, those possibilities exist when we open our hearts and our minds to the love of Jesus Christ and allow it to spread through us. I got to breathe, sorry. <laughs> What if, 
What if? Are you excited or are you terrified? <laughs> That's not a bad place to be. A little bit of both. A little bit of both. Are you willing to see what God might do? All right, we're going to pray and then we're going to sing and get out of here. Bless you. I can't wait to see what God will do. Let's pray.